wellnesscouch.com, streaming wellness into your lives. You're listening to A Quirky Journey, the healthy family podcast with your hosts, Joe Witten and Fuad Kassab. Welcome back, guys. Good to have you on A Quirky Journey again. Uh, this is Fuad Kassab, and with me is Joe, 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 Joe Witten. And, and now on to our podcast, Dr. Yes. Tom O'Brien. Wow, what a great podcast that was with Dr. Wow. Tom O'Brien. So good. I like. I think you should definitely get all your family and friends to listen to this podcast on gluten. Um, it gave me a few aha moments, and I took notes while we were doing the podcast because it was so good. It's uh, an eye opener for us, wasn't it, Joe? Mm, very much so. Like even for people who have been off gluten for as long as we have, we learned a lot on this yep. podcast, and he articulates gluten issues so well because. Um, it's quite needed. Like a lot of people have a lot of trouble understanding the problems with gluten and why it's doing them harm. And mm. we think this episode will be very, very useful for you to share with your friends and family so that you can get them off the poison that they're putting in their mouth three, four times a day. So important to listen to. And even if you've been off gluten yourself, you learn so much with this one as well. Dr. Tom O'Brien is uh, one of the leading uh, speakers on uh, avoiding gluten and the dangers of gluten in the world and it was a real honor and privilege to have him on the show yeah. and um we can't for, wait for you to to really hear what he has to say but um he also has some um extra details on uh, gluten and the problem with gluten on his website joe do you want to share those details yeah so he has a um, series of videos called betrayal the autoimmune disease solution they're not telling you um, where he talks through, um, I'm not sure how many videos it is, but quite a few um, where he goes into detail about what gluten does to your body, um, how, how it affects um, autoimmune, um, what it, how it causes inflammation, all these sorts of things and, and what to do about it, chronic fatigue, MS, all of those sorts of things and how people have um, reversed their MS and RA and chronic fatigue through getting rid of gluten out of the diet. Um, as that's the biggest step, he says. And then he also talks about lots of other tips, um, like removing toxins, There's all the sorts of things that we talk about. But just the way that he explains um, the whole problems with gluten and what to do about it, it's just very, very clear. And you can watch those videos for free. We'll put the link in the show notes. Um, it's the Betrayal documentary. And you can watch it for free. And then if you want to keep it, then you can get it for $47 through his website, um, which is quite affordable because it's a lot of information. Wonderful. I think it's nine episodes, sorry, nine episodes. Yeah, he's interviewed uh, leading experts from around the world on this topic and also people who have reversed their illness by avoiding gluten and uh, he's documented how that went for them. So it's really mm. fine stuff. And he's the author of several books on the topic, which he addresses in the podcast. So have a listen, mm. get really educated on this stuff. And uh, if you still haven't gone off the gluten, I highly recommend you listen to this so you can understand at least the extent of the damage that you're doing to yourself. Don't be afraid. Listen, face your fear. And all you have to do <laughs> is get off the gluten and you'll feel so much better for it. So, um, and don't worry, we have good options for gluten-free bread oh, that are amazing. It's so good. Like, Joe and I are still... It's not hard anymore. Six years, and I still have, you know, I haven't lost my sense of humor just because I've quit gluten. No, no. <laughs> you're going to be fine. You're going to be better than ever. So if you haven't quit, <laughs> quit this stuff, have a listen to the podcast and understand why you should. And um, we'd love to hear from you if you like this episode. Mm -hmm. Give us a good rating on iTunes. It helps other people find the show. And uh, we move on to the show and uh, we'll get to you, I think, one or two times before Christmas, maybe once, I don't know. Um, mm. have, a, have a great time and we'll catch you later. Dr. Tom O'Brien, welcome and thank you for coming on the show. Oh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Where are you at the moment? Uh, I'm at home, which is a bit of an exception, which I'm happy to say. <laughs> we know what that feels like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that, that is um, just north of San Diego uh, in a small town called Encinitas. Oh, wow. All right. I've got to check it out, see yeah. what, what that kind of town looks like. 
Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, Dr. Tom, we're really excited to talk to you about uh, gluten. This is one of those topics that um, we're highly allergic to. So, <laughs> you know, we're trying to get to the bottom of why gluten is such a big problem for uh, pretty much everyone that we meet and to address um, a lot of questions that people have around gluten. So well, um, can may, you... May I, may I suggest you take out the words we meet? And uh, when you say it's pretty much of a problem for everyone we meet, yeah. <laughs> take out the words we meet. For yeah. everyone. I was going yes. to ask you that, how common you find it. So pretty much everyone. <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, so here's, here's the bottom line. You know, if you just read the science, the science is really clear. Mm. No human has the enzymes to break down wheat, the proteins of wheat, into the individual amino acids that are the only molecules of protein that are supposed to get through the intestines into the bloodstream. Mm. Mrs. Patient, Mrs. Patient, your immune system, uh, back that up, your, your intestinal tract is a tube. You know, it starts at one end and it goes down to the other end. It starts at the mouth, goes down to the other end. And it's one big long tube, 20, 25 feet long. And it twists around, winds around inside the, the abdomen. The inside of the tube is lined with uh, cheesecloth. The reason that it's lined with a cheesecloth is called the intestinal epithelial lining. The reason that it's lined with a cheesecloth is because only the tiniest of molecules are supposed to be able to get through the cheesecloth and get into the bloodstream. So when you eat proteins of any type, any type of protein, hydrochloric acid, if you think of proteins like a pearl necklace, hydrochloric acid made in the stomach undoes the clasp of the pearl necklace. Now you have a string of pearls. Your enzymes that are that come from the pancreas, the gallbladder, the liver, the microbiota, enzymes act as scissors to cut the pearl necklace into each smaller clumps and smaller clumps and smaller clumps of the pearl necklace, clumps of the pearls, until you get down to each individual clump or pearl of the pearl necklace. Those are called amino acids. And those go right through the cheesecloth into the bloodstream and then your body uses those amino acids as the building blocks to build new bone cells, new brain hormones, new liver enzymes. Uh, all the cells that we make require protein as part of their construction, and the protein comes from the individual amino acids. The, and only the individual amino acids, and maybe two amino acids together called a dipeptide, are supposed to get through the cheesecloth to get into the bloodstream. The problem with wheat is that no human has the scissors to cut wheat down into each pearl of the pearl necklace. So if you are listening to this podcast, if you are human, <laughs> you do not have the scissors to break it down into each pearl of the pearl necklace. So those clumps of the pearl necklace that you're left with in the intestines, your immune system says, whoa, what is this? This is not good for me, and you, your immune plan that it, that it tears the cheesecloth. When the inflammation tears the cheesecloth, now bigger clumps of the pearl necklace can get through the tears in the cheesecloth into the bloodstream. So let me let me just get this uh, really clear here. So let's say someone who has a very intact cheesecloth, they don't have any problem with intestinal permeability, and they eat gluten just from the fact that they can't break it down and it's just sitting there in their gut. It's going to damage the cheesecloth through an immune response, even though they're healthy. That is correct. Um, Holon, H O L L O N, Holon and his team at Harvard. Published on this in 2014, there are seven papers I've got, but Holland's is the most recent, in 2014. And they said every human gets intestinal permeability when they're exposed to wheat. Every human. Now, the fastest growing cells in the body are the inside lining of the intestines. Every three to five days, you have a new lining to your intestines. So those cells are constantly turning over like the skin of a snake, just shedding and shedding and shedding that single cell lining called the epithelial lining, the cheesecloth, fastest growing cells in the body. 
So you eat a, a toast for breakfast, you tear the lining, but it heals. You have a sandwich for lunch, you tear the lining, but it heals. Pasta for dinner, you tear the lining, but it heals. Day after week, after month, after year, after year, after year. And if that were the only um, irritant that you were taking in, you may get away in a lifetime and never have a reaction that you notice to wheat. Hmm. But that's not, that's not the only irritant that comes in. Think about GMO foods. Think about bisphenol A. Think about red dye number three. Think about chlorine and water. Think all of the toxic exposure. The most toxic source to the human body is what's on the end of your fork. Mm. Day, day, day in, day out, day after day after week after month after year after year after year, there's more inflammation, inflammatory triggers going down there until one day there are so many inflammatory triggers the healing capacity of the inside lining of the gut can't keep up with all of the inflammation. And then, then you get the tears in the cheesecloth that don't heal. Right. So everyone gets tears in the cheesecloth, intestinal permeability, every time they eat wheat. But, and, and that's just the science. Read the science. Hmm. But it's when you cross a threshold. It's called loss of oral tolerance. And if you Google loss of oral tolerance, you will see, here come the studies. There are many, many studies on this mechanism that when you cross a threshold, and it can be when you're two years old, 22 years old, 92 years old, whenever you cross the threshold, now wheat becomes an added trigger, and it can be the mechanism that initiates and fuels whatever degenerative disease you get. Um, I've heard you talk about um, different types of gluten. So you say toxic gluten and non-toxic mm. gluten. And um, you mentioned wheat now in particular. And it kind of gives me the impression that there's types of uh, gluten in certain grains that are bad for you and some types of gluten that aren't actually as harmful for you. And I want to look at maybe the ancient grain variety of uh, wheat and gluten uh, that was contained in those compared to the new type of grains and also the other grains that we typically don't think of as gluten as things like rice and corn, but they contain a form of gluten. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yes, of course. Good question. Really good question. Uh, uh, gluten is not bad for you. Bad gluten is bad for you. Mm. And it's the gluten protein. Gluten is a term for a family of proteins in most grains. It's the gluten proteins in wheat, rye, and barley that we do not have the enzymes to break down. No human. No human. So the gluten proteins of corn, the gluten proteins of rice, the gluten in quinoa, uh, they are not necessarily, across the board, toxic to you. However, there is something called cross-reactivity, that when you make antibodies to wheat, as an example, 50% of celiacs, uh, if you eat corn, you get more antibodies to wheat. Or yes. um, uh, it, it's because the food looks similar enough that once this mechanism to protect you is turned on, your immune system becomes almost a little trigger happy. Uh -huh. That's something, something that looks similar to the protein structure of the peptides of poorly digested wheat. If there's something that looks similar to it, your immune system will say that's wheat and your wheat antibodies go up. Now, in terms, in ter one more thing, in terms of quinoa, they published a paper uh, in 2015 where they looked at 15 cultivars of quinoa. Oh, quinoa, that's a wonderful grain, healthy grain for you. You know, it grows on the plateaus um, uh, at elevation in Peru. No, it grows in the U.S. Oh, no, 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 it grows on plateaus at elevation at Peru. No, it grows in the U.S. Oh, no, 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 it comes from Peru. Yes, it did originally, but they crossbred. <laughs> They crossbred the quinoa from Peru with grasses from the midlands of the United States. And so now, because there's a market for it, a lot of quinoa comes from the United States. So, but it was crossbred with grasses that grow in the plains in the Midwest. So they looked at 15 cultivars of quinoa. What did they find out? Four cultivars of quinoa 
had toxic levels of wheat in them. Huh. The, the, the wheat gluten proteins, four of the 15 cultivars. You eat wow. quinoa and you think you're safe and you're not. So why you is may that? be. Uh, well, b well, because they crossbred with the grasses from the Midwest of the U.S. And some of those grasses have very similar protein structures to wheat. Mm. And so quinoa can be toxic to you. I mean, it's a terrible problem, mm. just a terrible problem. Uh, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that the, the inadvertent exposures to wheat that people have, and they don't know they're having these exposures, but it's one of the main re mechanisms as to why people don't get optimum health on a gluten-free diet. Yeah. It's because they're still getting exposure to toxic gluten proteins and they don't know it. So is it safe to say that um, gluten is in grains, but not probably in say root vegetables and other types of vegetables and fruits? So is it only in the grain family of food? That is correct. Okay, so um, the I want to go back to my original question about the older varieties of wheat and things like spelt and kamut. And just to look at that a little bit and see, do you know if there's any difference in the chemical makeup of gluten between the older varieties and the newer varieties of wheat? Yes, I do. Um, I've, I've read the papers on that, and I'll say two things about it. The first thing is many people say, well, it's in the Bible that wheat's good for you. And my immediate response is, with all due respect, no one on the planet is eating the bread that Jesus Christ ate. Yeah. <laughs> Stop saying that. Yeah. Stop hiding behind the Bible to eat your cookies. No, that's true. <laughs> so true. You know, you know uh, uh, but, but the, the scientific answer, the more uh, rational answer, is that once your body crosses the line of oral tolerance and you make antibodies to these peptides, these clumps of the pearl necklace of wheat, and there are 62 different peptides that have been identified that your immune system may react to. Once you make antibodies to the peptides of poorly digested wheat, the ancient strains have those same peptides. Mm. Or they're ex very, very similar so that, and they, they've looked at this in detail and they've published on it. You still trigger an immune response. So if you catch someone, you know, theoretically, if we were to expose um, new, not newborns, but infants to the ancient strains of wheat, never expose them to the more modern strains so their immune system never gets activated to fight these things, all humans react to the current wheat, all humans do. And when you cross the line, you start making antibodies, now you're toast for the rest of your life. That was a joke, uh, but true. <laughs> You have jokes uh, like but, you, for one. <laughs> but, but, but if you were to um, uh, introduce the ancient strain to um, a toddler when you're introducing solids to them, and the window is between um, uh, somewhere between four and nine months uh, to introduce tiny amounts of ancient strain of the wheat, there's no papers published on this, but theoretically it makes sense. Uh, that that person may not develop the sensitivity to wheat that all humans do because humans are exposed to the commercialized strains. Yes. Uh, and once you cross the line and make the antibodies, elevated antibodies to it, it's permanent. It doesn't go away. It's permanent. So if you don't get to that point of crossing the line and losing oral tolerance, could those people theoretically eat pizza from ancient strains of wheat. Yes, they could, theoretically. But it's pretty much impossible in our day and age, you're saying, to well, avoid. <laughs> that's uh, right. Doc, Dr. Tom, that's you, what, you mentioned uh, about like the insidious sources of, of wheat as well. So that means even if someone hasn't been eating the wheat, it, it's probably in their shampoo, in their makeup, mm. things like that too, right? Two scientists from the FDA, three scientists from the FDA, um, uh, published in 2015, they looked at um, uh, 286 foods labeled gluten-free. By law, they have to be gluten-free. And 180 foods that were naturally gluten-free, such as rice cakes, rice salt water. That's naturally gluten-free uh, for, for the toxic glutens. 
they, they looked at this close to 500 foods and they did two different types of laboratory tests called ELISA testing on the, all 500 foods. What did they find? For those foods that were labeled gluten-free, 97.8% of them were gluten-free. You know, and as an industry, that's pretty good mm. uh, when all but 2% um, are gluten-free. That's pretty good. Unless you're a celiac and you get one of that 2% of foods, then sure. you're toast. It doesn't matter. You're toast for months, for months from one exposure. But yeah. those foods that were naturally gluten-free... 24.7% of them had toxic levels of gluten. One out of four of the uh, uh, foods um, that you read the label, and there's no wheat in there, no wheat byproducts, one out of four had toxic levels of gluten in them. Hmm. And the, hmm. the majority of them uh, contained oats because oats are commonly contaminated, commonly. But some of them... Um, did not contain oats. It was nuts and seeds and other grains that had toxic levels of gluten in them. So it's an overwhelming concept to realize when you read the science that it is impossible to protect your family from being exposed to inadvertent sources of wheat. It's almost right. impossible. That's why uh, only 8% of celiacs heal um, 65% get better, but only 8% of them heal. Mm. And that's why it's because of these inadvertent exposures that are still causing, well, that's one reason why, there's a few reasons. There's, it's the inadvertent exposure that still triggers the inflammatory response. And I knew about this for years because I read the papers, the research papers, and I would talk about it on stage. And finally, I met a couple of scientists one who six years and the other seven years they'd been working on coming up with an enzyme that would really work because all of these gluten digesting enzymes that are out there, um, if it's a good enzyme, it likely works. The problem is it takes three to six hours for them to digest this really tough protein that the human digestive tract can't break down. It takes three to six hours. And the sentries standing guard to protect you in, inside your gut are called den dendritic cells. They're right inside the first part of the small intestine. So anything that comes out of the stomach that is potentially inflammatory, like these peptides of wheat, it activates the dendritic cells, which turn on the whole inflammatory cascade. So you eat a food and you take most of the digestive enzymes that are out there, they're going to work three to six hours after you take them. But now the food's already down into the large intestine. So your small intestine is all inflamed and the systemic inflammation has begun because the enzymes take way too long to work. Yeah, too late then. It, it, right, it exactly. doesn't actually do anything. So, well, no, they do help if you've got rectal symptoms or, you know, they do help, but, but, okay. they, but they're not complete. Okay. So, so I met these two scientists, and together we worked on this for two years. Um, uh, and we came up with enzymes, 99% full degradation of all wheat, inadvertent exposures to wheat, corn, soy, egg, peanuts, fish proteins, shellfish, 99% in 60 to 90 minutes. Complete digestion. Wow. And that product is called E3 Advanced Plus, the letter E like for, for enzymes, E3 Advanced Plus, and it works really well. So we get lots of testimonials. On, uh, uh, thank you so much. At last, I can go out to dinner with my husband, you know, for mm. people that are so sensitive that they have a reaction. So, so you would take that before you eat? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right before, not during the meal, unless you um, right. uh, really suspect um, uh, an exposure, then you'll take it before and during, but before, so nothing gets through. It sits at the bottom of the stomach waiting and nothing gets through that hasn't Sorry. been digested. Are we saying this enzyme is to allow you to eat like a pizza or is it to protect you from just these trace sources of gluten that you might not be aware of? Like, And do you still need to avoid it as best you can? 
Well, you know, you're 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 thinking like an American now. <laughs> he just knows that we'll get asked that. <laughs> how much how much can I get away with? Yeah, uh, exactly. And that that's what people ask. And so, you know, I, I I used to not tell them this, but you know, now I'll just tell you: one capsule will digest a full slice of whole wheat bread. Uh, but uh, but it's foolish. Yeah. to risk any games, you know, because you can't mess with the immune system. It's not going to be fooled. Mm-hmm. If it gets activated, one exposure, one crouton, if you get activated, if your immune system gets activated, you've got elevated antibodies for two to six months Wow! from one exposure. That's what I wanted to ask look, you, because I tell my kids this and they don't listen to me, so now they can listen to you. <laughs> yeah, you bet. You bet. So, so when does it take that long? Why is it wow. six, after six months? Of, how, how come that takes so long for the immune system to go back to normal? When you get a vaccination for measles, they give you a shot of the bug, measles. Your immune system, your brain says, whoa, what's this? This is not good for me. You, yo, immune system, general. And there are many generals in your immune system, Army, Air Force, Marine Corps generals sitting around with nothing to do. General, you now are general measles. Take care of this. General measles builds an assembly line, takes a couple of months, builds an assembly line. That assembly line produces special forces, soldiers, trained specifically to go after measles. So they get out into the bloodstream and they're traveling everywhere in the bloodstream with high powered rifles looking for measles. Anywhere they see measles, they fire their chemical bullets called cytokines and they destroy the measles. Mm -hmm. General measles is watching all of this. And when all of the measles from the vaccination have been killed off, General Measles says, okay, turn off the assembly line. I don't need any more soldiers right now. Then your antibody load goes down. But General Measles is now vigilant the rest of his life. He's called a memory B cell. For the rest of his life, if you ever get exposed to measles, General Measles just has to flip the switch does not have to build the assembly line again that takes months. That's why if you go to Africa, you need vaccinations two to three months ahead of time for yellow fever, dengue fever, all these weird diseases so that there's enough time to get protection. But if you go back 15 or 20 years later, you just need a booster shot two weeks before you go. You just have to wake up general measles again. Mm -hmm. The, The same thing is true with wheat. Once you cross the line and you make elevated antibodies to wheat, you've got a memory B cell. It never goes away. It's memory. It's your body's memory. It's there to protect you forever. So when you're exposed, general gluten turns on the assembly line, just has to hit the switch. Now the assembly line runs for anywhere from four to six weeks to make sure you've killed off all the measles, killed off all the gluten. It's running for four to six weeks. And the lifespan of the antibodies is anywhere to two to three months once they're made. So they're in circulation, just traveling around all the time, looking for measles or looking for gluten everywhere they go. So when you get one exposure after you've lost oral tolerance, you now will get antibodies for anywhere from two, three, up to six months. That's why it takes so long. So unlike, uh, say, a viral infection or a bacterial infection, when the immune system attacks and actually successfully kills the um, the invader, what happens to the gluten? Because it's not actually a living molecule. Um, well, what yeah, goes yeah, on there? Yeah, no, it's the same thing. It's the same mechanism. It's it's cytokines that destroy the, the, the stri- cell structure of the bacteria, that destroys the cell structure of the wheat molecules, just breaks it down into debris and gets rid of it. Right, so that actually does take place. So the immune system does effectively, uh, is capable of breaking down the gluten as it enters into the bloodstream? Uh, uh, Well, not not as it enters into the bloodstream. That that would be great. Um, You know, it gets activated. and, uh, and, And then you're off to the races. And remember, there's no lanes of traffic in the bloodstream. Everything's just going in the same direction, but it's all bouncing around in there. And so we like to think of the antibodies as Arnold. Here in California, we, we call him the governor. 
<laughs> right? You know, he's he's up there in his big Humvee with his head out the sunroof, got the big dark glasses on, the black leather jacket. Over there, over there. <laughs> oh, it's everywhere. You do that well. Well, thank you. <laughs> that is the mechanism for what I'm about to describe to you, which is called molecular mimicry. And this is the real problem with wheat. This is what it comes down to. Yeah. So Arnold has been trained by General Gluten to go after that specific, specific peptide, the structure of that specific peptide. Remember, there are many clumps of the pearl necklace from poorly digested wheat. So you may have antibodies to many, and we've had many patients that have 10, 15 different clumps of the pearl necklace they're making antibodies to. Mm. But let's just take one. When you're making antibodies to the most common one that most places in the world, the laboratories only look for one of the 62 peptides. They look for one called alpha glidin, and they say they're testing for a wheat sensitivity. No, they're not. They're testing for an alpha glidin sensitivity, which is one of the 62 possible sensitivities. And there's more than, more than 62, but they've identified 62. So you now have this um, special forces soldier looking for the molecular structure of alpha glidin. And I'm gonna say it's A, A, B, C, D, but that molecular structure is 33 amino acids long that the soldier is looking for. Well, what immunologists tell us, and there are a number of papers on this concept of molecular mimicry that tell you it only takes six amino acids in sequence of the 33. You don't need all 33 amino acids in sequence. All you need is six of them in a row for the special forces soldier to get confused and say, oh, look over there, there's one. He's hiding, but there's one. And he mm -hmm. fires his chemical bullet at that. So you've got special forces in the bloodstream going past the thyroid as an example. The inside surface of the thyroid facing the bloodstream is made up of proteins and fats on the surface. Those proteins on the inside surface of the thyroid facing the bloodstream include A, A, B, C, D mm. as part of the hundreds of amino acids of the proteins that make up the surface of the thyroid facing the bloodstream. It includes A, A, B, C, D. So now you've got Arnold looking for A, A, B, C, D and over there, and he fires his chemical right. book at it, and now you damage the thyroid cell. Right. Right. So the, the wheat antibody damages the thyroid cell. Not a big so, deal. Wait, hold on. Yeah, yeah. Not, not a big deal, except you have toast for breakfast, pasta for lunch, sandwich for dinner, mm -hmm. more soldiers, more soldiers, more soldiers. And if your genetic vulnerability to molecular mimicry is your thyroid, you keep attacking the thyroid. You keep attacking the thyroid, you're attacking the thyroid, you're attacking the thyroid, and eventually you develop the autoimmune disease of the thyroid called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Very, very common. Or if your genetic vulnerability is to myelin, which is a saran wrap that covers your nerves, the antibodies to wheat go after myelin. That's MS. That's the mechanism of MS. Or if the genetic vulnerability you have is to your joints, the antibodies go after the antibodies to wheat go after your joints. And that's rheumatoid arthritis. So it goes on and on and on. There are hundreds of articles on all of these different conditions. They get so much better when you get them off of wheat. Yeah. And this is the primary mechanism as to how it happens. So this is a really important point to focus on for the listeners. That we're talking here about the root cause of autoimmune diseases. So uh, when an inflammation or an inflammatory response happens in the immune system towards wheat, if there's a part of you that kind of looks like wheat, your body is going to continue to uh, attack that and it will create your specific autoimmune symptoms or autoimmune disease and then if you're for instance you've got uh, a thyroid issue the doctor is going to try to treat the thyroid or if you've got like an autoimmune arthritis they're going to try to, to deal with that but none of them is actually dealing with the underlying issue and the fact that the auto uh, the immune system is actually hyperactive and attacking your body when it shouldn't be so then taking the gluten out of the diet makes the immune system a little bit calmer and that way those specific uh, receptor sites within the body are not being attacked anymore. Is that correct? 
That is correct. Uh, uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of case studies published in the medical literature reversing schizophrenia mm. on a wheat free diet, reversing Hashimoto's on a wheat free diet, eliminating symptoms of MS on a wheat free diet, clearing up the skin on psoriasis on a wheat free diet. Now, obviously, every psoriasis patient, this is not the cause of it. But what the literature tells us is 28% of psoriasis patients have elevated antibodies to wheat. 28, one out of four have elevated antibodies to wheat. This is a critical concept for people to understand. That's why my book that came out last year, The Autoimmune Fix, is so important to read. Hmm. Shameless plug, shameless plug. <laughs> Go for it's, it. That's good. It's That's not good. Because it's not because it's my book. It's because you really need to get this. This is the primary mechanism for all degenerative diseases is autoimmunity, your immune system mm -hmm. trying to protect you. And this book goes through, it's not only wheat, of course, it's bisphenol A, the chemical that is used in molding plastics. Mm -hmm. It's uh, uh, air pollution, it's bacteria. They're, the, the mechanisms of molecular mimicry are not limited to wheat. But wheat is the most common food that the research has demonstrated can trigger different autoimmune diseases. So really, it's the first thing people should always look at, first thing to take exactly. out. Exactly. And then work on the others. Well, what do you see with, um, say, the ways that we used to prepare wheat? Because I've heard this said before, and people kind of always, whenever you tell people to get off wheat, they're going to come up with an excuse and they'll say, first of all, they'll say, like, I love my pasta or I love my bread. And they use the word my as if it's like theirs, you know, <laughs> like yeah. Smeagol from Lord of the Rings, like my precious, don't yes. take it away from me. But yes. um, the, there's such a resistance to it. And then people start going, well, maybe I can move to sourdough. And there's a like some like an argument that's floating out there, but I don't really know the science, whether it's true or not. It's, it says that sourdough fermentation, like a prolonged fermentation, of an ancient grain will denature the proteins and, and that the gluten will be somewhat pre-digested and won't elicit an immune response. Is that correct? You know, I, uh, there's a song that's going through my head, you know, from the 1960s. <laughs> this is my story, sad but true. <laughs> <laughs> so keep people make stuff up. Now, there's no question that fermentation helps to break down proteins. There is not one study that has ever shown after you cross the line and you've got memory B cells to wheat, you've got elevated antibodies to wheat by eating sourdough bread or any other type of normal uh, wheat containing breads, you're able to calm down the, the immune response. There's not one study, mm. not one, not in mm. test tubes, not in humans. There's not one study. There's a whole lot of hope. And of yeah. course the industry, the industry would love it to, you know, to be able to stand their ground on that, but they can't. You know, but but they try, and so people will come up with this and um, um, show me the study where your immune system calms down uh, what, uh, by eating sourdough bread, and I, I'll sing the praises of. I, I wish I could eat sourdough bread. I love sourdough mm. bread. It's been years since I since I've had any though. So so someone who's actually healthy, would you suggest that they even stay away from wheat even when there's nothing going on in them? Like, would you just tell them, hey, look. This is going to be a problem for you down the track, so may as well not start playing with fire now. Like, just not get your immune system hyperactive like within the next few years because it's going to happen, or is this inevitable, or what is it? Like, or, or can can some people tolerate this stuff? That's that's a really good question. No one can tolerate it. It's whether you've crossed the line with all of the other toxins and you've lost mm -hmm. oral. Toxins. That's the bottom line. Okay, so everyone will eventually go down that line. It's yeah, just a matter of time. Yeah. Yeah. And this is this is what I need to say. And I'm really struggling um, in how to get this point across that impacts and gets past people's I love my cookie mm. concept. It's really hard, but we don't have time to mess around anymore. Mm. We don't have time. Mm. I'm I'm gonna tell you two studies. The first one, the World Wildlife Fund about a year ago, published a study in conjunction with two major universities that on average, there has been a 58% loss of all vertebrate species populations on the planet between 1970 and 2012. Wow. In 42 years, we've lost 58% of everything that has a spine. 
birds, insects, mammals, we fish, we've lost them. They're gone forever, forever. Now, and for, for terrestrials, it was 36%. For those living near fresh water, it was 78%. 78% oh, wow. of everything is gone. Why? Because they're drinking the water. And if you were drinking the water coming out of the rivers by your house, you'd get cancer quicker. You'd be unable to reproduce, just like the animals. Mm. That's, the first, that's the first study. The second study brings it home to humans. They did a meta-analysis, which means they looked at a number of research papers on one topic to see if there was agreement or consensus. So they did a meta-analysis of 180 studies on sperm count in healthy men between 1974 and 2011. So that's 37 years. And in 37 years, on average, there is a 59% reduction in sperm count in healthy men. Mm. Now, sci scientists worry about extinction of a species at 72%. Wow. We're at 59% in 37 years. When are we going to wake up? Mm. You can't keep living the lifestyle that you were born into and you feel entitled to because that's what we've always done. Well, you're, we're killing the planet with the way that we do that. And we're killing everything that lives on the planet. So we all need to wake up. This is not a discussion about what's a better form, what's a better form of vitamin C or where, where should I get my coenzyme Q10 or I can't tell, should I go paleo or should I go autoimmune diet? What should, we have to change the way that we think about all of this. We have to wake up or you, you younger generation people are gonna be unable to reproduce or for sure your kids are inheriting a planet that they can't live on. There aren't going to be fish in the ocean in another 25 years, according to the Environmental Working Group. There's not going to be fish in the ocean wow. in 25 years. We have to wake up that we're all blindly going forward while corporations make their billions of dollars. We're doing all these comfortable things with plastics and, and uh, uh, genetically modified foods, and we have to wake up. And wheat just happens to be the most common food that triggers the inflammatory cascade and you cross the line of oral tolerance. Wow. Right, so so in, in, this is like looking at your vision for uh, planetary healing, you find that like getting rid of wheat would be one of the biggest things that will do that? Is that it's what, what I... It's a prerequisite. Okay. It's a, it's a prerequisite. You have to read the book, The Autoimmune Fix, because we go, for example, when, when you pump gas in your car, can you sometimes smell the gas? Oh, yeah. Sure. You're breathing benzene. Mm. Benzene is a neurotoxin that causes cancer. You're standing downwind. So what do you do? Walk around to the other side of the hose. Now you're upwind. You don't smell it anymore. I mean, we, we have to start thinking about these simple things. My book is full of all these little simple things to do. Mm. When you come home, you take you take your shoes off when you walk in the house. Why? It's not some Zen Buddhist thing. Rather, you walked home and you were walking on the sidewalk and your neighbor sprayed the sidewalk to kill the dandelions with Roundup. Mm. Now you've got Roundup on your shoes. You walk in the house with your shoes. Now there's Roundup on the carpet. Your infant's mm. crawling around on the carpet. Now your infant's got Roundup on his hands. It gets in his mouth, gets in his body. You leave the toxic world at the door outside. That's why you leave your shoes. You know, there's all these little things. We just have to start thinking this way, people. We can't be blindly going down like any uh, limic, you know, just going down to our doom the, the way that it's happening right now. We have to wake up. And you folks have a great venue to carry messages out. I hope both of you will read my book Definitely. because you'll say, oh, this just makes sense. <laughs> this does. must make sense. So in every interview, Whoever you're interviewing, whatever their specialty is, from exercise to singing to clothes, every well, tell, tell us the clothes that don't pollute the planet. You know, mm -hmm. that you start thinking this way and being a catalyst to save the planet. Or your kids, and for sure your grandchildren, aren't going to have a planet to live on. Mm -hmm. So th this is definitely in line with what we do, uh, Dr. Tom. We uh, Our aim is to basically bring health back to uh, families so that Our it becomes goals. very clear to them 
that their health and the health of the planet and the ecosystem is one and the same and that if they're going to really be healthy themselves they have to look after their own um the the, the area that they live in the supportive uh, farmers make sure that they're uh, using uh, meat and vegetables from sustainable farming practices that they eliminate yeah. all these things that are toxic in their household and by reducing the demand for these things we increase the demand for healthy uh, sustainable products out there but I, I, I do want to, uh, you mentioned Roundup, and this is something I want to talk about a little bit uh, with you, because there was a documentary called uh, called What's With Wheat on, uh, it's now on Netflix. I'm not sure. Have you seen that one yet? No, I haven't. Okay. So this is made by an Australian um, naturopath um, called Cindy O'Meara. She's oh, a naturopath, yeah. is that right? Yeah. Nutritionist. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. Nutritionist, sorry. Yeah. Uh, and I, think, since, since, I think I'm in it. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, so you, you might thinking, be right. So, yeah, like, okay, good. Yeah, yeah, there you Cindy's go. Cindy's a All good right, so, of uh, Yeah, she yeah. was great. I, I know that I've talked to her a few times, and okay. I don't know, I don't recall what the venue was, but yeah. yes. So um, she uh, talks a lot about um, Roundup that's sprayed on the wheat and uh, the shikimate pathway um, and the way that that kind of uh, – basically destroys this metabolic path pathway in us and gives us all these um, inflammatory or chronic illnesses that come uh, just by the fact that there's Roundup on our food and the wheat is drenched with it. So is yes. there, um, apart from the gluten, is this an added thing on top or how, how do we view these things as well in conjunction like with the Roundup and the wheat together? You know, um, I'm not sure what the terms are where where you are and perhaps you can tell me as i describe this if you're going to start a uh, charcoal fire for a barbecue uh you know you squirt the charcoal lighter fluid on the coal on the charcoal and then you light a match and toss a match on there sometimes the match won't catch and and you have to light another match and gently lay it on the coal so the uh, the flame is going and then you squirt the charcoal lighter fluid but you you can't squirt it on the flame or the, the flame goes out. You have to squirt it on the charcoals and then the spray, the, the flame will catch the spray and then it starts, right? Have you ever had that experience? Yeah. Okay, good. So wheat is like charcoal lighter fluid um, on the coals and for a while the flame won't catch, the match won't catch until you have oral to loss of oral tolerance and then, it, then it's like the fire's already started and you squirt more charcoal lighter fluid on it and it just goes whoosh right away, you know, because there's already a fire there. So that's wheat. Um, um, Roundup, glyphosate, and instead of using charcoal lighter fluid, if you had poured gasoline on those coals and threw a match on it. Yeah. Whoosh. That's yeah. right. So that's the effect of GMO foods. And... Um, uh, Monsanto has gotten away with saying that uh, Roundup doesn't have any detrimental effects to humans because it doesn't in their studies. But what they avoided saying is that it kills the microbiota mm. and by the pathway that you reference. But the, the, the microbiota is not human. It's in humans, but it's not human. And that's how they got away with uh, wow. having it packed Sneaky. and legalized. Yeah, very sneaky. Very so, so it doesn't affect human cells directly, but it affects the bacteria and the viruses and the fungi and that um, the microbiome that we have, and therefore, well, it, 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 by affecting them, it affects our system. But they can just get away with that, with say that it doesn't affect us because it doesn't have a direct impact on ourselves. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly right. That's how they got away with. It. That's how they got away with it. Now, um, what you need to know is the dangers of going wheat-free. Uh, almost everybody, almost everyone, feels better within a couple of weeks, two to three weeks, going wheat-free. Almost everyone does, unless you have other foods that you're still sensitive to that you don't take out. That's why in the book, you'll read that we recommend wheat, dairy, and sugar for three weeks. Get it out of there. Yeah. And, and, and we give you a lot of options of um, how to be vibrantly healthy. Um, but what, what you have to know is that 76% of the prebiotics, those foods that feed the good bacteria in your gut called probiotics, the 76% of the prebiotics 
in the Western diet are wheat based. Mm. So when you take wheat out of the diet, you eliminate three fourths of the prebiotics that you were taking to feed the good bacteria who are trying their best to hold on and are having a really hard time just holding on in life because of the GMO foods and everything else. And when you stop feeding the good bacteria because you've taken their food away, which is the arabinoxylans in wheat, you know, wheat's not all bad for you. There are some things that are good, but the bad outweighs the good by far. So when you've taken wheat out of there, you take away the prebiotics. Those are the people three months down the road, they've got new symptoms. They're feeling sick in new ways. And they have no clue as to why, because they're wheat free and they feel better being wheat free, but they're sick for something else. It's because you've altered the microbiota and the good bacteria have died off from not being fed and the bad bacteria just thrive in that environment. So now you've got what's called dysbiosis that's much worse than ever before or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that's much worse than ever before because mm -hmm. you took wheat out and you replaced it with these wheat free products that are just paste. They're all just white paste. Yeah. It's not it's not healthy to eat gluten free pasta or gluten free blueberry muffins or gluten free bread. Totally agree it's with not, you there. <laughs> not health food. Mm. It's just paste. Now there's now there's nothing wrong with having a uh, blueberry muffin gluten free once in a while. Who cares? But you just can't eat that stuff every day and depend on it. It's yeah. white paste that, that just puts fat on you. So what we have recommended to people is to get back to mostly vegetables, some meats, you know, the nuts and seeds, things like that. So can you explain exactly what you would recommend for a diet? Yes, of course. And uh, it's elaborated in great detail in my book, mm -hmm. Shameless Plug, Shameless Plug. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone, everyone needs to read this so that they just understand this big picture. But let me tell you, at least part of uh, some components if I may, mm -hmm. of building a healthy microbiome. Mrs. Patient, when you go shopping, go to a natural food store or, you know, the health food store, organic vegetables, always, always organic. And in the vegetable section, buy a couple of every root vegetable they have. Get rutabagas and turnips and parsnips mm -hmm. and sweet potatoes and different colored carrots and different colored beets. And every day, you have at least one root vegetable, every single day, one root vegetable, because each family of root vegetables are different prebiotics that feed the good bacteria in your gut, that feed the probiotics, and they feed different families of probiotics. So you don't want to just eat sweet potatoes all the time. They're good for you, but you want to have some turnip and some rutabaga and some parsnips and whatever root vegetables grow in your part of the world, because root vegetables have a lot of insoluble fiber that feed the good bacteria. So that's the first thing you do. The second thing is you go to Google and you type in list of prebiotic foods. And here comes the list. And you'll see bananas are there and avocados are there and many foods that you've been eating on, on an occasional or regular basis are really good foods for you because they're prebiotics. And so you include two of those foods every day, along with the root vegetables every day. Yeah, so, so we've got the root vegetables and the prebi pro prebiotic uh, foods yeah. now in, in the diet. And we've eliminated um, the grains like uh, wheat, rye and barley, and oats by the sounds of it as well. But, uh, what about legumes? Are the, is there room for those in the diet? Well, it depends. I know some people are sensitive to um, uh, 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 agglutinins, uh, and some le most legumes fall in the family of lectins. You know, and some people are sensitive to those. And so, if they're not sensitive to them, then they're a good source of uh, nutrient for you, fiber and nutrient. Yeah, they're just excellent. But some people have a sensitivity, so you have to check and see. Mm. The, mm -hmm. there, there's two components to feeding yourself and rebuilding your microbiome. The first is the food for the microbiome, and that is the prebiotics. And the second is repopulating 
the probiotic environment. Mm -hmm. Now, in repopulating the probiotic environment, the most important thing on the probiotic environment in your gut, the good bacteria in your gut called the microbiome, the most important thing is the diversity of the good guys. Critically, critically important. Mm. So it's not, it's not going to fix you if you take a capsule that has lactobacillus sacidophilus and bifidobacteria. <laughs> it's, it's helpful, but you need hundreds of different species of the good bacteria because there are thousands of species in there in your gut. And so you want to, you want to repopulate for diversity. And the way you repopulate for diversity, Mrs. Patient, when you go shopping, buy five different types of fermented vegetables. Just make sure they're not pasteurized. Mm -hmm. Five different types. Buy sauerkraut, buy kimchi, buy miso, buy fermented beets, buy curry flavored. Just get a bunch of them. And every day you have at least one forkful of a different fermented vegetable because the fermentation process produces all of these good bacteria for you. And every vegetable, when it ferments, produces different strains of the beneficial bacteria. So mm. you're, you're re-inoculating yourself with many different strains when you alter the fermented vegetables that you eat every day. And you say, well, my son, my 12-year-old son doesn't like fermented vegetables. Doesn't matter. <laughs> take take your spoon and take the juice of the fermented vegetable and pour it into the mashed potatoes. Yeah. He doesn't have to. He doesn't have to taste it. You just have to get it down there. And so get it down there any way you can. Mix it with the peanut butter. You know whatever it takes. Mm. Come up. You know. And there's a bunch of options in the book on how to do this. But become creative if you need to. But get the re-inoculation in there. Nothing strengthens the human body like a robust, vibrant, dynamic, protective microbiome. Most important you could do, most important thing to protect your brain. My new book comes out next May. It's called Fix Your Body, Fix Your Brain. Ah, good. That, that sounds interesting. That you don't fix the brain by treating the brain. No. You, you fix the brain by treating the body. And so you have to figure out what's wrong. It's, it's the premise of functional medicine. You know, it's just the premise. I mean, we've got uh, 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 Dale Bredesen now is teaching uh, at the Institute for Functional Medicine on reversing Alzheimer's. Mm. And he's got, he's got over 100 patients, fully documented. Wow. Wow. MRIs, MRIs, cognitive test scores. Every, the people who were in facilities, they couldn't function at all, are back home living with their families. Wow. People who couldn't work anymore Amazing. are back to work. Yeah, there's right. nothing that you there's nothing that you can't help. Absolutely nothing. You just have to be comprehensive enough. Mm -hmm. And in Dr. Bredesen's program, there were 37 things on the checklist. Uh, top of the list. Do they have a do, do they eat wheat? Get it out of there. Do they eat dairy? Get it out of there. Mm -hmm. And you just go down the checklist and you fix what the problem is. Do they have uh, wait a minute? I'm about to sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> That's you. Do, do, thank you. Do do they have um, Heavy metal toxicity. If they do, get it out of there. Uh, do, do they have toxic chemical toxicity? If so, get them out of there. Do they live in a toxic environment where the air pollution is really bad? You know, there's a type of Alzheimer's called inhalation Alzheimer's. It's, it's what you breathe that's causing the inflammation in the brain. If so, get an air filtration system in your house. That's where you spend at least a third of your life. Uh, and all of that's in the book. You know, this concept is... The autoimmune mechanism is the primary mechanism causing the degenerative diseases in the world today. So if you understand how your immune system is trying to protect you and the collateral damage is destroying your own tissue while it's trying to protect you, then you understand you have to reduce the need for your immune system to protect you. You don't, you don't try to suppress the immune system. Yeah, you know, it's doing its job to protect you. You have to reduce the need for the mm. protection yeah. by reducing the exposure to whatever the offensive agents are. Wonderful. That's, um, 
a lot of information and I'm sure that the listeners will uh, buy your book and really get into the details here because there's so- it sounds like um, people will read the book and be able to identify these environmental factors within their life as well and start being able to address them. Things uh, I've heard you talk, for instance, about chlorine before and getting that out of the water and the importance of that and things like the address in, uh, makeup or body products and all these things as well. And if uh, a podcast on its own isn't going to be enough for someone to actually get to that full understanding, so highly recommend that you purchase the book. What's the book's name again, Dr. Tom? The Autoimmune Fix. Fantastic. Where, where can people find you and where can they find the book? Oh, thank you. Uh, the book's on Amazon. Uh, uh, it's also on my website. The website is the dr.com, the doctor.com. Just don't spell the word doctor out, the dr.com. And um, there's one more thing I'd like to tell you. And that is um, I spent a year and a half traveling the world, interviewing the world leaders in autoimmunity. For example, Professor, Ye- <laughs> Professor Yehuda Schoenfeld is at Tel Aviv University in Israel. This guy, 28, at last count that I know of, 28 of the PhD students that studied and got their PhDs under him, and there are many more than 28, but 28 of them now chair departments of immunology in med schools and hospitals around the world. They're his students. This is the godfather for uh, all the people that are at the top of their game in immunology. And when you listen to, and, and I interviewed 85 of the world leaders. Then I interviewed the doctors who were applying the clinical principles that these leaders were researching. And then I interviewed the patients of the doctors who were applying the protocols that the doctors were recommending. And you hear the patient talk about how she reversed her MS, that she couldn't walk and she had eight lesions on her brain. Now, two and a half years later, she has one lesion left and she has no symptoms. Wow. Wow. And you hear the people reversing their rheumatoid and reversing their lupus and reversing their Hashimoto's. And you hear all of this and you go, oh, my God. Oh, my God. That is very cool. Mm. That is, wow. Wow. And it's called betrayal. The autoimmune disease secret they're not telling you. Yes. And it's free. It's free online. You go to my website, thedr.com forward slash betrayal. And it's right there for you. And it's nine episodes, all about an hour each. You'll, you'll get one episode every day. And it's free. And you, it, it'll, it'll just empower you. So between betrayal and the book, The Autoimmune Fix, you will have the tools to ask the right questions for the health of you and your family. That's so helpful. Thank you so much for that. We'll yes. put links to those things in the show notes so everyone can find them easily. That'll be great. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Tom, thank you so much for being with us on the show. We really, really appreciate it. Um, I'm sure this episode will get a lot of interest from our yeah. listeners and hopefully we'll be able to get you back to address specific questions they might have or something like that. So uh, really, really appreciate that you took the time to talk to us from all the way across the world. And uh, we hope, what is it, nighttime now? We hope you have a good evening or mm-hmm. what is it? Well, thank, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> Um, it's um, late afternoon going yeah. into the evening and the sun is setting soon. Yes, yeah, thank you. It's a real pleasure. And I hope your listeners will listen to this interview again because I know I know it's so power packed. I know there's so much and it's overwhelming. I know, but wake up. Mm. You have to wake <laughs> up. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I know yeah, I was taking is... notes during the interview because it was so good. <laughs> so thank you. I'll listen to it again. <laughs> No, I think it's going to be something that's really going to help our listeners. So we really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks so much. You're very welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. This has been a production of thewellnesscouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash thewellnesscouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst the Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.